Good evening my maths family and welcome back to my channel the Sofa Sport Reviews where I have a bit of a heavy heart. We're going into our last proper week of Married at First Sight Australia for the class of 2024. We did it, we got there, we stuck it out together and I'll admit there was times where I wanted to scream into a pillow and I felt emotionally drained tonight being one of those nights. But all in all, I think this has been a really bloody successful season. I've really thoroughly enjoyed it. I've loved talking about it. And I watched it consistently the whole way through. There wasn't a week where I kind of just said, ah, not in the form. Where I normally have a week, you know, once a season where I kind of drift off. So I don't know about you. What do you think? Do you think that this was a good season? Do you think it was a pile of shite? I'm guessing if you're here listening to a review, you have been watching it and you have somewhat enjoyed it. Now, whether or not we have any maths next week, the jury is out. I'm not 100% on if we get like the end of final vows next week or some kind of a reunion or God knows what, but I'm here for it. I'm here for all of it. Now, tonight was the final commitment ceremony and holy shit, do I have opinions. Now, the only people that I'm really going to skip over, I normally try and skip over one or two, but the only people that I can really fully skip over is Sarah and Tim because I'm sorry snore fast forward they're never gonna last so let's not waste our time we'll start maybe with Eden and Jaden shall we so I am still kind of banging my head off a wall with these two I actually like this couple together and I think that's why I'm banging my head off the wall so hard but they're still not a-okay and they're going into this commitment ceremony in pretty rough shape so Eden kind of feels like she can't argue with Jaden because he just doesn't have that off button and in turn she's kind of shutting down and doing that kind of childish thing where yeah fine you're right whatever whatever you say and it's just not productive <laughs> I mean like she doesn't know what else to do so as much as I understand why she's getting frustrated and I understand why he's getting frustrated they need they need help on this they need to figure shit out they need someone to mediate this mess because like I said last week, as much as I can sympathise with Eden and I do not doubt that she is up to her eyes with anxiety, unfortunately, in a relationship, you will argue and there's going to be times where your partner is acting like a prize wanker and you can't just say, oh, well, do you know what? We just we just won't argue from here on. That'll solve it. I mean, it's a great idea. <laughs> like in theory, yeah, that would solve a lot, but it doesn't always work in practice. Now, in Casa de Jack and Tori, we get a very sinister little nugget of information from Tori. Apparently, she's been speaking to a bride who is no longer in the experiment. And this bride has given her some information about one of the couples that are still in the experiment. And it's not good. It's going to be a bombshell. It's going to ruffle some feathers. And Tori's going to be the one to bring this up. And she feels, in her words euphoric. She feels euphoric that, you know, she gets the honour of dropping this bombshell. Now, I have mentioned this so many times that I had seen a bit of a spoiler on someone's thumbnail a few weeks ago and I didn't click in so I never got the full spiel but I just saw an image that kind of gave me a massive spoiler. So at this point, I kind of feel from the way that they're building it up at this point in the episode, I'm confident that I know what it's going to be. And it's even more disturbing that Tori is saying that she's going to be the one to drop this information and that she's euphoric about getting the chance to do so. I find that quite vile and unsettling. But anyway, we'll move on. So we get to the commitment ceremony and first up are Eden and Jaden. And she does kind of speak her mind. She says, I feel like I have no voice when I'm with Jaden. I feel like there's no way to end an argument unless you just roll over and say, yes, Jaden, you're right. I bow down, whatever you say. And, you know, if you resist or if you kind of disagree or you don't go along with what Jaden says, the argument just doesn't end. It continues. It goes on and on and on. Whereas we've seen Jaden kind of say, in contrast, he feels like when there is a disagreement and he tries to resolve it, you know, Eden doesn't really want to get into it. She just wants to say, okay, fine, I'm sorry, let's move on, let's forget about it. And sometimes I think that is the right course of action. Sometimes someone just has to say, oh, fuck it, who cares? It's not a big deal. Will it matter in five years? Probably not. I'm sorry, let's move on. But you can't do that every time because if you just brush things under the rug, eventually you've got a really lumpy rug and it's a terrible trip hazard. 
And granted, Jaden can be a bit self-righteous. He can be like a dog with a bone. He can be master interrogator. We saw this in Feedback Week. You know, he really let his freak flag fly when it came to being the moral high ground police. But I can genuinely feel the frustration in him when he's on the couch tonight because the experts are taking what Eden's saying and they're they're trying to get it into Jaden's head. But he doesn't understand. He's getting defensive. He's getting kind of back chatty and a little bit cheeky. And they're calling him on it and pushing back on him. And the more they do that, the more frustrated he's getting. And it, it doesn't seem to me like Jaden is this toxic asshole who just wants to steamroll Eden. I think he genuinely believed that he was doing the right thing and over communicating, you know, as Mel had said to them last week. And he doesn't understand now why he's being told, no, Jaden, you're in the wrong. And he gets really upset and you can see his whole face getting puffy and red. And Eden kind of comes in and comforts him and they end on a good note. They both say stay. And then you even see them later on in the episode when the other couples are up on the couch and she's got her head and a shoulder and they're kind of cuddled up. So I don't think that this is beyond repair. They are annoying me at this stage. So I'm very happy that we're coming to the end of their experiment, shall we say. I'm, I'm done with this particular relationship and being a fly on the wall for these guys. I hope they go off into the sunset and live happily ever after. Uh, next, let's talk about Ridge and Jade. So I was expecting to just completely fast forward and skip over these guys, but actually surprise emotion. I'm ashamed to say that I did well up a little bit. I almost shed a tear when Jade was talking. I found this really touching. She was just talking about how she was having some doubts and she kind of came out with it and said, listen, I'm really into Ridge and I'm very worried that he's just going to leave this experiment. He'll find someone pretty and nice and ha who has a simpler life and situation than I do. And she's referring to obviously the fact that she comes as a package deal with her daughter. And yeah, she, she gets really, really emotional about this. Her voice is what did it for me, lads. It was when her voice started to break. I was like, oh, here, you know, not today. And Ridge just tells her, you're mad. Like, I'm coconuts for you. And I really, really like this couple. And I know the couples on this, they never last really, do they? Even the good ones don't last for the long haul. But... I could see these two together. I really could. And they both say stay. They both feel really happy. And they both feel like they have true potential to kind of fall in love with each other. Now, I think Ridge is pretty much already there, but he's just not going to make a show of himself and say it and get pied. But yeah, I, li I liked this. This was a nice moment. Next, we get Lucinda and Timothy. Now, this wasn't a bad moment, but let's just get to it. They both say leave. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so happy that we didn't have to drag this out for a whole other week because what a fucking farce this has been. And Lucinda just tells the experts about the homestays and we won't repeat it. We've all seen the homestays, I assume. And Timothy's kind of given his excuses and his shoulda, woulda, couldas and I'm not interested. It's just, it's time for him to reveal his little thing. Just say leave, just be done with it. But look, they're civil She's remained a lady right up until the end and she even wrote this funny little poem. It was quite cute and I think it was the perfect kind of fuck you. Not that she's intentionally, you know, trying to give a fuck you to Timothy, but he always says, you know, give it to me in straight language, none of this flowery shit. And she knows that he doesn't like the feelings and the poetry. So what a better way to say, do you know what, Tim? I'm better than this. I deserve more you didn't try with me than to say it with a poem and look they both smile they laugh they hug and she tells him you know I, I'm always there as a friend my door will always be open and um, they they leave it on a good note and good for Lucinda and she says you know I do hope that some nice other suitors will slide into my DMs and I'm sure that they already have I'm sure when she gets home she will have suitors from all over the globe offering to slide into anything that she wants. So next we get to Tori and Jack and they're asked straight at the gate, you know, we heard the news, you had sex, you consummated your relationship at homestays. Anyway, and you know, they're talking about this moment and when they finally had sex and it was like the sharing of a soul. It felt like two souls coming together or at least, you know, that's what Tori said it felt like anyway. <laughs> 
mean, I, I can't speak on it. I wasn't there. And suffice to say that Jack's not exactly as enthusiastic and as flowery with his words, you know. But I mean, maybe he did truly feel that his soul was touched by Tories when they had sex with each other, allegedly, at homestays. And has anybody else noticed that since everyone came back from homestays, Tori has not said a single word about her experience with Jack's friends, well, we, <laughs> clients, whoever that little gremlin and her mute friend was. Like, not a peep about any of that. The only thing that they have mentioned is that they've had sex. Everyone focus on that. And Tori now suddenly doesn't want anything to do with anyone else in this group. She's completely now isolated herself from all of the others. So, yeah, it was a very interesting turn of events since homestays, shall we say. And she's asked by Alessandra, you know, or maybe it was Mel, I can't remember. But she's asked, you said at the dinner that you didn't really see anybody here as a friend and you wouldn't keep in touch with anybody after this. You know, where did that come from? That's a bit of a, a heavy statement. And Tori starts crying. And I actually think that this is the first genuine moment of emotion that we've seen. It's the first time we've seen her get properly teary and choked up, as far as I can remember. And the group is all reassuring her. They're like, we care about you, Tori. Like, we do want the best for you. And Lauren is singled out by Alessandra and she's asked, you know, what do you think? You've always been vocal about this relationship. So, you know, penny for your thoughts there, Lauren. And Lauren just kind of says the same thing that she always says, that, you know, Jack does all of these things and you don't ever seem to have too much of a reaction, but you have a reaction with us. You know, you'll pop off with people in this group, but just never with Jack. And look, Lauren's wasting her breath at this stage. It's falling on deaf ears time and time again. And Tori and Jack, of course, they both say stay. And Tori, straight away, she's still taking this as a slight. She's saying, look, Lauren is still coming for our relationship. Lauren was asked a question by one of the experts, point blank. She didn't heckle. She didn't chime in. She was asked. And then when they go back to sit with the rest of the group, you can see that Tori's leaning into Jack's ear and she's whispering to him, I need to bring something up when Lauren and Jono sit down on the couch. And I'm like, here we fucking go. So Lauren and Jono are called up to the couch and I don't even really take in much of what they are saying because the whole time that they are talking and they're saying, you know, everything's going great. Our homestay was really positive. We've come back together. We've, you know, had a sexual relationship again for the first time in ages. Things are going really well. But as we're hearing Lauren and Jono talk about how their time has been over the last week, Tori is over to the side. You know, she is just waiting for her moment. She is sitting so far on the edge of that seat. It looks like she is trying to fight back a bout of IBS. She's got her hands on her face. She's literally like, <laughs> she's rolling her eyes. She's covering her face. She's making faces at Jack and the other people. And it's almost as if like she's trying to get somebody's attention. So they say, well, Tori, have you got something to say there? I can't help but notice that you're scoffing maniacally into your own hand and rolling your eyes on a constant basis since Lauren and Jono have sat down. But nobody takes the bait because frankly, there is nobody in this group desperate enough to ask Tori for her opinion on a relationship. So she sits there and she lets them get to the end of their kind of couch session. And it's almost as though she wanted to let them talk about how great their week has been and how well they're doing and how much they've rebuilt since they had their issue, which, by the way, was kind of caused by Jack and Tori. But anyway, but she waits until they've, you know, set themselves up so it can be just as vindictive and malicious as she can make it. And she says, guys, I have an announcement, everybody. You know, there's something I really just want to bring up at this moment in time. Uh, Jono has been texting Ellie. It's come to my attention that Jono here, the one that's sitting on the couch there with my friend Lauren, yeah, he's been texting Ellie. You know that girl with the massive knockers that was on this show that left that Jono used to always defend? Yeah, Jono's been texting her. What do we all think about that? Oh, Jesus Christ. And like, I knew it. I knew it, but ow, my elbow. I knew it, but I didn't know it, if you know what I mean. Like when Ellie was on this experiment, I joked all the time saying that, oh, Jono has such a crush on Ellie. And I genuinely did think that Jono had such a crush on Ellie. 
And I really, really liked Ellie and I thought she deserved so much more than that piece of shit Ben that she was with. But look, we'll get to Jono in a minute, but this is just a horrid, humiliating, upsetting bombshell. Like Lauren's face. Lauren is one of the funniest, spunkiest, like most badass, say it as you see it kind of gal. Like she is the kind of girl you would want to go and have a beer with. She's the kind of gal that if she was your friend, you know she would have your back and she might not always say what you want to hear, but damn it, she would say what you need to hear. And she's very much like Tori's friend, Leah. There's no bullshit about Lauren. So to see her have this moment where, you know, she was starting to feel good again in this experiment and then have it stripped away, And like I said, we'll get to Jono. Oh, we'll get to Jono. But this from Tori, this was what Tori was talking about earlier and saying that she was euphoric knowing that she had this information and that she was going to get to deliver this and throw this out there. She was excited to throw this out there. And no part of her seemed to feel the need to pull Lauren to one side or pick up the phone to her or speak to her alone or even to the side, you know, with the other girls. The way they have done with Tori every single fucking time Jack has done some shady shit. But no, she specifically waited. And not just, you know, till she saw her at the commitment ceremony, not till they were sitting down in front of the experts or even until... You know, Lauren and Jono sat down on the couch. You know, she didn't say, listen, guys, before you start, I need to say something. She waited until they finished talking about how wonderful their homestay was. And then she threw this out there in Lauren's face. And that is the difference between Tori and Lauren. Tori's partner has made a show of her, a fool out of her time after time after time. And every single one of those times that Tori's partner has made an absolute fool out of her, those girls in this experiment, Lauren in particular, have told her what was going on from a place of wanting her to know, not being the last to know and not being blindsided by it. But here we are, the tables are turned and Lauren's partner has done something really shitty and she wasn't taken to the side. She wasn't spoken to woman to woman. This was done to hurt. And Tori did this with a smile on her face. She wants to make Lauren look foolish. She wants to make her look like a fool because that is how Tori has looked throughout this whole experiment. But here's the kicker. It's not Lauren that's made her look foolish. It's Jack. It's her partner that has made her look foolish. And at this point, I can only feel sorry for Tori because pointing out the problems in other people's relationships will never make her relationship any healthier or any happier and actually Lauren doesn't look foolish at all here she looks hurt she looks heartbroken and unlike Tori Lauren stands up for herself and she doesn't attack the messenger she takes this up directly with Jono in that moment she doesn't try to stuff it down and pretend I'm cool with that it's just banter yeah no Lauren doesn't play that shit Lauren has self-respect and Jono, that spineless little snake, I have stood up for him time and time again. I have always kind of given him the benefit of the doubt when Lauren was maybe a little bit too harsh in her words. But that spineless, ballless little liar can't even own up to this. And he just kind of says, well, I text everybody. I mean, this is innocent. I've not really had any intentions behind it. I just, I'm friends with everybody bullshit and Lauren is in tears and she's saying well I I was very friendly with Ellie when she was in this and I'm not texting I'm not getting texts from Ellie every couple of days like Lauren knows everyone sitting around right now knows what is going on here like we're not stupid don't piss on our leg and tell us it's raining and even John the expert kind of chimes in and says listen Jono even if you don't have any intentions towards Ellie you don't know what her intentions are towards you and it's not really right or decent of her to be reaching out to you she's not in this experiment you are and you've basically omitted this information you've lied by default and you've been texting another woman behind your wife's back and you've not been open about this and I feel so terrible for Lauren I want to reach through the tv and hug her in this moment because like I said she is completely blindsided this was a gut punch she had no idea that this was coming 
and Jono is responsible for his actions and Ellie sorry that little that little hussy has a lot to answer for as well so I'm not saying that this is Tori's fault that either of these guys have done this shady shit behind Lauren's back but she is definitely guilty of being conniving and vindictive this was done in a really nasty way so I do truly hope that Tori enjoys these moments in life where she can these you know opportunities to make another woman feel humiliated because she's going to spend the rest of her life letting men do that to her. Lauren's going to move on, Lauren will find somebody better but I don't think that Tori ever will. So here's your moment, here's your vindication, enjoy it bitch and also I think Jono needs to hand over his phone right now. But that was it. That was our episode. That was our final commitment ceremony of Married at First Sight Australia 2024. What did you think? Were you surprised? Did you have it spoiled for you like I did? Because I definitely knew that there was going to be something with Jono and Ellie. I didn't exactly know what form it would take. I had just seen a picture of Jono and Ellie holding hands. So the cat was kind of out of the bag, but I just didn't know the specifics. I didn't know how and when it was going to go down and what exactly was going to go down and yeah I I feel really really sad for Lauren to be honest I was kind of hoping that Lauren and Jono were going to go downhill and break up and then Jono would reappear with Ellie that's kind of where I thought it would go but knowing now that Jono and Lauren were actually in quite a nice place and they were doing really well and then this was just thrown out there and um, took Lauren by complete surprise was horrible it wasn't nice to watch but yeah that's it guys for tonight i'll be back again tomorrow i hope you all have a lovely evening and as always sweet dreams